as Father's Day approaches, I'm reminded of one of the saddest stories of absent fathers in the home. Many people have forgotten, I believe it was the 1991 case of Robert Little Yummy Sandifer. But Denzel Washington brings it up in this interview when he talks about the real way to solve the problems with gangs and violence. You know, incarceration rates in America has been a problem, especially as, as opposed to minorities. And Roman delves into this, the, the issues around the, the legal system. Do you think we've made any headway? In the I think it's more important to make headway in our own house. By the time the system comes into play, the damage is done. They're not locking up seven-year-olds. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was in Chicago a couple of three, four weeks ago, and we saw these little kids on bikes with masks on the side of their head, like five or six of them. And the driver said, yeah, they're little yummies. I said, who? He said, little, little yummies. Look up, Google little yummy. Mm. Little yummy was an 11-year-old murderer. Wow. And you look at his picture, you'll see the headshot of him, and he's like this. And he got murdered at 11 by a 14-year-old. Wow. Who's doing life now, and a 16-year-old. Wow. That makes no sense. You, you blame the system? Where was his father? Fathers. Yeah. It starts in the house. It starts in the home. And yeah, well, well, my father got locked up. Well, where was his father? You know. So true. Let's hear uh, these stories of Robert Little Yummy Sandifers are still being told today. Okay, let's check out this interview with the Hardaway Brothers right before their release. As reporters, there are some stories that just stick with you through the years. And for our Tanya Francisco, it was the story of Yummy Sandifer, young man who at 11 years old had a rap sheet longer than most adults. He died violently, gangland style, by 14 and 16 year old brothers. Well, tonight, for the first time, we hear from both of those brothers about that fateful night, what they've learned, and their hopes for the future. It's a story you'll only see on WGN. At 36, Craig Hardaway is older, wiser, but he's also a little nervous when it comes to this interview. I always saw media as the enemy. 20 years after a notorious murder that thrust him into the national spotlight, for the first time ever, he and his younger brother Derek are talking about the case that changed their lives forever. It took me years to really admit and accept my role in it. It was an unusually chilly September night in 1994 as the body of an 11-year-old was loaded into the back of an ambulance. He had been shot twice in the back of the head in a hit ordered by the leaders of the Black Disciples. What happened that night? Chaos. Despite numerous requests over the years, this is the first interview Craig Hardaway has agreed to do. Craig was only 16 years old when his mugshot was plastered on TV, arrested for the murder of 11-year-old Robert Yummy Sandifer. His brother Derek, 14 at the time, was too young for his mugshot to be released. He was convicted of driving the getaway car. All three, Craig, Derek, and Yummy, members of the same gang, chasing money, respect, and trying to make a name for themselves. For me, it was more like identity. It was more like, okay, I want to belong to something. I want to be a part of something. If we haven't figured this out as a society yet, we got some real issues. Look, these kids, and these kids, these Hardaway brothers, they weren't coming from a real bad home. Robert, little yummy Sandifer, he was coming from a tragic, a tragic mess of a life in foster care, abused with so many broken bones, even when he was a toddler. And look, when you come from a, a place where you have no significance, no power, no prominence, no prestige, nature abhors a vacuum. And if you have no significance and no power, and no prestige, and you got nothing positive in your life, you're going to find it from the closest alternative you can. And that's the story of the street. It's an addiction. It's a strong addiction, and it pulls you in quick. 
It was a clear black night, a clear white moon. Warren G was on the streets. The summer of 1994 saw Nate Dogg and Warren G's regulate topping the charts. O.J. Simpson preparing for the trial of the century in Chicago, well on its way to recording 930 homicides, the second highest on record. Among the dead, 14-year-old Siobhan Dean, shot in the head by a stray bullet during a shooting spree in the city's Roseland neighborhood that injured two other teens. Chicago police quickly identified 11-year-old Robert Sanderfer as the gunman. That led to an intense three-day manhunt. Gang leaders decided that Robert needed to be silenced because he knew too much, so they ordered Craig to kill him. Why did Robert die? By means of not my control. And was it your life versus his life? Absolutely. You thought it was that simple as either you do this or you die. And that's how it always boils down. It's, it's not like any rigor room when you live in that lifestyle. So you're saying you had no other choice? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Derek refused to leave his brother's side. A lot of people don't know that, that he actually took me home. And I can just feel someone right. So when I asked him what's going on and he told me everything, I refused to let him go by himself. I should have been more of a big brother than us get out, right? But at the time, that ain't the way you think. I'm still a mighty, we still kiss. Hours after the murder, both brothers were in custody, and months later, it's they were true. convicted felons. Craig, 60 years for murder, Derek, 45 for driving the Gataway car. They were the only two ever tried in the case, even though they say others were involved. Why not tell? Because I was believing in the foolishness they was telling me as the gangs and that lifestyle. What did they tell you? How they gonna be there, support, take care of us, our families, everything. And? Nothing. Literally nothing. No letter, no contact, no money for me, my family, they needs, no lawyer, literally nothing. Abandoned by their fellow gang members and isolated from their families, the brothers have spent the past 20 years rehabilitating themselves. Both have gotten their GEDs and associate degrees. Derek is cultivating his landscaping skills by working in the prison garden, and Craig is involved in anti-violence programs. But for Craig, there is one piece of unfinished business, reaching out to Yummy's family, who has not responded to him or us. What would you say to them? Wow, I'm sorry. Um... I'm sorry. Uh, I answer any questions that they may have concerning that night leading up to that night. Both brothers say they think about Yummy's murder every day. The tears, they say, have long since dried up. Instead, they're focused on getting out one day and making sure that others don't end up on the same path that led them to prison. I think if they hear it from someone that lived it and been through it, it might reach them a little bit better. I know most people uh, listen to this and be like, what the hell do this dude know? He been in jail for 20 years, he should have did what he did, yada, 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 yada. That still don't take away from the message. Value your life. You matter. Look in the mirror and tell yourself that you matter. Um, and the way a young man is supposed to know he matters is by looking in the face of his father and getting his father's approval, his father's affirmation, his father's edification. These these young men, these boys, weren't supposed to, aren't supposed to be out there trying to figure out who they are. This should break the heart of a real man. Um, accept <laughs> that the responsibility of your life ultimately rests with you. Derek Hardaway is eligible for parole in 2016. Craig Hardaway will be eligible in 2024. Neither brother plans to return to the Roseland neighborhood where they grew up for fear that they could be drawn back into a lifestyle that Derek says will only lead them back to prison or to a grave. Tanya Francisco, WGN News. All right, thanks to Tanya. That, that was the first, first time I ever heard an age that yeah. young, 11, with Yummy Sandifer. That, uh, that, that gripped the, not only the city, but the nation, but the, the yeah. city for years. Yeah, on the cover of oh, Time yeah. magazine. Amazing. Yeah. 
Here go the bio of Robert Lil Yummy Sandifer. Born March 12th, 1983. Murdered September 1st, 1994. Also known as Yummy or Lil Yummy. He was an 11 year old boy from Chicago. His murder by fellow gang members in Chicago garnered national attention because of his age, resulting in his appearance on the cover of Time magazine in September 1994. His nickname originates from his love for cookies. Standing just four foot six inches tall, Sandifer was a young member of the Chicago street gang, the Black Disciples. After committing murder, arson, armed robbery, he was murdered by his own fellow gang members who feared he could become an informant and that he was attracting too much attention towards their activities. Coverage of Sandifer's death and the retrospectives on his short, violent life were widely publicized in the American media. Sandifer became a symbol of gang problem in America, inner cities, the failure of society, social safety nets, and its shortcomings of the juvenile justice system. And I would say of the public social DCF Dis D Department of Family and Child Services, that structural catastrophe as well. In the early life of Robert Sandifer, he was born in Chicago on March 12, 1983. Sandifer's mother, Lorena Sandifer, had over 30 arrests for prostitution, many of which were drug related. Sandifer's father, Robert Akins, was absent throughout Sandifer's life due to incarceration for a felony gun charge. Sandifer was physically abused from the time he was an infant. <clears throat> an infant. Before he was three years old, Sandifer was already known to the Department of Children and Family Services, DCFS. Physical examination showed that, Rob, that Sandifer was alleged to have had cigarette burns on his arms and neck, as well as linear bruising consistent with physical beatings. Lorena initially blamed the abuse on Sandifer's father, although she was she later recanted that. In 1986, Sandifer and his siblings were removed from the mother's home by DCFS and were sent to live with their grandmother in the Roseland neighborhood of Chicago. His grandmother's residence contained as many as 19 children on some occasions. By most accounts, his grandmother's home was not much better than Sandifer's previous home. Sandifer, by the age of eight, had quit attending school and began to roam the streets, stealing cars, and breaking into home houses. At the age of 10, Sandifer was arrested on charges of armed, armed robbery. A psychological examiner at the time reported that Robert is a child growing up without any encouragement and support and that he was he has a sense of failure that has infiltrated almost every aspect of his inner self this is the story of many of these young men today in 1993 Sandifer and his siblings were removed from the grandmother's home and were sent to the Lawrence Hall DCFS shelter on Chicago's north side from which Sandifer ran away and never returned From 1993 until his death, Sandifer's whereabouts and living arrangements remain unclear, although he continued to be arrested by the authorities. Just in, slipping in and out of the cracks. On August 28, 1994, Sandiford was ordered to do a favor for his gang. He opened fire several times with a 9mm semi-automatic pistol, striking several youths. Sandifer quickly fled the scene among the victims was a 14-year-old girl, Siobhan Dean, who was fatally hit by a stray bullet. After the shooting, the police were looking for Sandifer, who was hiding with gang members in the neighborhood. On August 31st, while standing on a neighbor's porch, after asking to call his grandmother, Sandifer was met by brothers Craig and Derek Hardaway, ages 16 and 14, who were both members of the Black Disciple Street Gang. Sandifer was told he was being taken to a safe location out of town and ordered into a waiting car. Instead, he was taken to a railroad underpass 
on East 108th Street and South Dauphin Avenue and was told to get on his knees while kneeling. Sandifer was shot twice in the back of the head by the Hardaway brothers. Sandifer's body was discovered by the Chicago Police Department in the early morning hours of September 1st. Around 400 people attended Sandifer's funeral, which was held at the Youth Center Church of God in Christ on Chicago's northwest side. The Hardaway brothers were later convicted of Sandifer's murder. Derek received a 45-year sentence, and Craig received a 60-year sentence. And Derek was released from prison in December of 2016. And Craig was released from prison in December of 2020. Well, unfortunately, this can't be attributed to the failure of a child, but to the failure of a family. It can't even be attributed to the failure of a government or a system or a structure. Because the first line of defense against this type of lifestyle is the family. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, and honor your father and mother. And there's a first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And verse 4 gives the onus of this responsibility of these children's lives to the fathers. Verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath or anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We need men who are willing to step in the gap. And if the fathers aren't there, we need uncles. We need cousins. We need nephews. We need men to stand in the gap. To restore this land. From the New Testament to the Old Testament, the testifying factor of society remains this Ezekiel 22 and 30. God said, I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach or stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. And I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord God. When men fail to take their proper position and their top proper place in society, it is a retribution to society, a retribution to the family, and children fall through the cracks. James 1 26 through 27 if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart this person's religion is worthless there's a lot of religion there's a lot of talk but verse 27 says religion that is pure and undefiled before god the father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is Brother Rob Wilson. What I believe we need in society today, as we always have needed, is men of God, with the courage and the tenacity of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Root of David, who steps forward to open the scroll. And we need men who are willing to step forward and intercede on behalf of the fatherless, the orphan, the abandoned, and the abused. Peace and love in Jesus' name. Pray for our nation, pray for our children, and pray for our fathers to get in their places and to take their positions. Amen.